O thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence, they are all thy servants, and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at thy table of bounty. All are illumined through the light of thy providence. O God, thou art kind to all. Thou hast provided for all, dost shelter all, conferrest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with the talents and faculties, and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one, so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O oh God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O oh God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O oh God, the hearts together. O oh thou kind Father God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving, and thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. Abdu'l-Baha. Thank you so much, uh, Penny, for that beautiful prayer. We are so pleased to have with us uh, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Dalton Garris, who has been really giving uh, several sessions, um, talks on the Holy Quran. And this afternoon, he's going to be talking about the Holy Quran in depth. And especially the topic for today is that the Holy Quran is in fact our inheritance. So Dalton, when you're ready, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So this is a this is a class that's going to be made up mostly of question and answer, going back and forth. Uh, but I do have a brief introduction to get us uh, <clears throat> to get us all landed at the same place. This is from uh, high writings um, gleanings from the writings of Baha'u'llah, uh, page 44. Say, peruse ye not the Quran, read it, that haply ye may find the truth, for the book is verily the straight path. This is the way of God unto all who are in the heavens and on earth. And later on in the Kitab Yadan, which I'm going to reference almost continuously, he says that, uh, the Holy Quran is the surest testimony of God to man. Now he says that, I believe, on page 110. Uh, page, I'm sorry, page 151 uh, in the Kitab Yagan. That's it. If you have the old edition, if you have the new edition, it's paragraph 160. So let's, uh, let's, start, let's start this way. Why do you suppose His Holiness Baha'u'llah uh, wanted us to uh, study the Quran when, in fact, uh, we are supposed to have with the Akdas and all the other all the other writings uh, everything we should need to continue on our way along his path. You know, let's uh, let's put it another way. Let's back up uh, about two thousand years. Let's ask this question. Uh, Ask yourselves, whom do you think has a better knowledge of the Old Testament? Would that be uh, Jews who have not accepted Christ Jesus, or would that be Christians who have accepted both Moses and Jesus? The correct answer is 
those who follow the New Testament and believe in it. And the reason is quite simple. Um, as you can imagine, it's because much of what the was inferred and employed in the uh, Old Testament, and Jesus explained it and answered it. And he also changed a couple of laws to help mankind on its, on its way. Um, he changed the law of the Sabbath day and he, the law of divorce. And that was to uh, hold until the coming of His Holiness Muhammad when another revelation would be revealed. Now then, ask yourself this, who knows more about the Bible, Old and New Testament, Christians or Muslims? The right answer would be, of course, Muslims because they are following the latest manifestation of God. In addition, as we have just heard, as we have just read, His Holiness Baha'u'llah calls the Quran the surest testimony of God command and wants us to study it. So that's pretty straightforward, pretty clear. And if you do study it, the first thing you have to do before you study it is to read the book that unseals the Quran and all previous holy books. And what book is that? What is the, what's the, the thing that does that? It's the kitab Yagan. The kitab Yagan, or the Book of Certitude, was, re, was revealed by His Holiness Baha'u'llah, or by God, through the mouth of, through the pen of Baha'u'llah, in two days, 48 hours. And uh, it was to answer a couple of questions, but uh, that was uh, presented to Baha'u'llah by the maternal uncle of the Ba. But of course, he wrote using this inst using this vehicle to reveal. Now it's now now it was time to reveal this book, the Book of Servitude. And why is it so important? Because it explains the true meaning of all previous holy books in the Adamic cycle. That is the cycle beginning with Adam and ending with Muhammad the seal of the prophets. After that, we have the Bab, which, which is gate, as you know, neither of the old nor of the new, but the gate through which, uh, through which mankind passes to get to the new cycle, which the, is the Baha'i cycle. And if we read a little bit, we know that the Baha'i cycle is, will last much longer than the Adamic cycle which lasted about 6,000 years. Uh, yeah, six, six or 7,000, no, about 8,000, I'm sorry, about 8,000. Um, it's gonna last about 500,000 years. And about once, after, he said, after a thousand years, another messenger will come, but he will be under the shadow of Beha. So this is going to go on for quite some time. We're just beginning. And thus, we are just beginning to understand the significance of what God has revealed in the previous books. You might recall from the book of Daniel, if you look at the last chapter, in fact, the last page of the book of Daniel, where you will read where it says, and I think this is uh, chapter 12 of Daniel, but it's the, anyway, it's the last page and it's quite famous. So you probably are all familiar with it. Where God says to Daniel, go thy way, Daniel, for the book is sealed until the time of the end. Men will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. And then there are certain things, signs that are given and then Daniel sees two messengers on either side, one messenger on one side, one messenger on the other side of the Tigris River, he's standing there. And wouldn't it be incredible if that place where he stood and where he saw the manifestation of God was the same place where the garden of Najibua, is it Najibua? Najibia, Najibia, I believe. Najibia was, uh, was made. And then where Baha'u'llah went, it's now called the Garden of Rizwan, where he revealed that he was, in fact, the promised one of the voyages. 
he's probably standing where Adam stood, and that is probably the ancient and uh, place where Eden was supposed to be. Now, this is just speculation. There's no, there's no way to nail it down as of yet, but it's fascinating to think about these things. So we now have established uh, by evidence that um, those who follow the latest manifestation of God not only understand that manifestation and th those writings to some extent, but understand previous writings to a great extent. Now, what is your, uh, what, what do you think you would wager if I suggested that the next manifestation of God will tell us things about what Baha'u'llah says, what he has written, what we read, that we don't know, that right now is still hidden from us. Uh, there is the story in, uh, or there, there is the, the recounting in the, uh, uh, the Dawnbreakers, and also in God Passes By, I believe, where His Holiness Baha'u'llah ordered, instructed that writing some of the writings that he had revealed uh, during the past 24 hours or whenever it was, were to be taken down to the Tigris River and dumped there. He said they are too beautiful for the mind of man to bear at this time. So we await the next manifestation of God who may tell us what those writings are were or are, it's the same thing in the next world as, as this past, present, and future as it would be and it is. So even though Christ Jesus said, uh, when asked about uh, Isaiah's uh, verses where it said, uh, <clears throat> and unto us a child is born, a son is given, and he shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And Christ said, this is not me. He said, I don't bring peace, I bring a sword. We also know that he carried no government upon his shoulders, and he was not called the Father, he was called the Son. Uh, even though he didn't call himself the Son of God, he called himself the Son of Man through all the, all the writings, all that we have of him, he called him himself, he referred to himself as the son of man. But that didn't stop uh, Christians uh, in a later age, uh, Handel, for instance, of putting that in Handel's Messiah, this Messiah that he wrote and uh, putting those words in there and we, it is sung every, every Christmas. So then the Muslims come along and with this wonderful testimony of his holiness Muhammad, it was revealed he, he couldn't either read nor write, as you know. But at over a 23 year period, he revealed the word of God. And uh, then those words were taken down and compiled according to a, a, a code or a system that he devised uh, so that it would be all be there. And it was to last, of course, as we know, for 1,260 years, a very long time indeed longer, uh, there's a longer distance then between uh, prophets of the past, I believe, although I'm not quite certain as to uh, when Christ Jesus came after his holiness, Moses. But uh, in any case, as we will read in the Holy Quran, we will read the story of the Old Testament. We'll read many things that we didn't know before that weren't made clear or were just kind of a little fuzzy in terms of time, in terms of when things happen and, and in terms of uh, who was involved in the things that happened. For example, um, there was an amazing story, a wonderful story that is included in the Hadith about how and where the mighty building of Mecca where the uh, black stone is stone that uh, Abraham used and was going to use to sacrifice uh, Ishmael on it. No, not Isaac, absolutely uh, no. And the reason we know that is uh, Abdu'l-Had tells us, but also the Quran tells us 
as we know, even from the Bible, Isaac wasn't born yet. It says that his firstborn was offered up for sacrifice. Well, that was Ishmael. He was born before Isaac was born. So then there are many, many stories, and there are, I'm not going to go through them all because there is, we've had a, an entire uh, course on this to some extent, and I will make available to anyone who wants them um, notes on the entire Holy Quran of those uh, verses that we may find interesting. Now, this is a, the, the choosing of these verses is a completely subjective uh, feature on my part. Uh, there's nothing scientific about it. I noticed that certain words uh, seem, to, uh, seem to be very, very uh, uh, cogent and germane uh, to understanding um, not only Islam, but understanding the Baha'i faith. The reason is because, you know, we come to the Baha'i faith in, in maybe one of two ways, or maybe an intermingling of both. One way is that we come in thinking, okay, all old laws are gone. We don't need to follow any of the old laws. All we need to do is look at the Kitab Yagdas, the laws of Baha'u'llah, and follow those laws. Everything else that preceded it was dead, is dead, and uh, remains so. Others say, or think to themselves, I'm coming into the Baha'i faith, but I'm bringing with me laws pertaining to those things, those elements that His Holiness Baha'u'llah did not specifically refer to, nor did Abdu'l Baha, nor did the, the uh, Universe House of Justice or Shoghi Effendi. Uh, for example, His Holiness Baha'u'llah says really nothing about economics, does he? Uh, Abdu'l Baha uh, draws a, a fuller picture, a clearer picture, but still there's a lot remaining uh, that uh, we just simply have no idea about. Uh, Baha'u'llah said, we, we do not bring you a, a, an economic system. We have not devised a system for you. The, the, uh, the solution to the economic problem in the world is spiritual and not material. And we accept that. But what are the moving parts? How exactly is this realized in our daily events? Well, uh, I, for instance, have studied the Quran for many years, looking at the economic content that it has in it, and it has a lot in it. And it just occurred to me, and again, this is, this is just uh, from me, it's just as uh, my own speculation, that by opening the book, unsealing the Quran, we would find not only economics in there, but all sorts of things pertaining to sciences and uh, living arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that, we, that we didn't know before, but that, that have been in there and laying there, but they haven't been discovered because previous uh, followers of, of uh, Muhammad did not know this because Muhammad said it would be revealed at a later time or inferred that it would be. And His Holiness Baha'u'llah unsealed the book with all these meanings, including economic ones. That is to say, um, economic principles that we can use in our daily lives, in borrowing, in investing, in going into debt, in paying off debts, in banking itself, in saving for retirement and retirement, all sorts of things like that, what labor should be paid and how we sort out how much and what labor should be paid, et cetera, and how much the originator of the idea, the owner should be paid. Uh, much of this is in the Quran, much of it is. Uh, a lot of the Quran really, when you, when you come away from reading the Quran several times, you get the impression that that, that that age, uh, God didn't want us to do a lot of borrowing, especially for business. Now, if we needed to borrow for, because our daughter has, has graduated from school and we're gonna have a 
have a party for or something like that. And so then you lend the money. But it's, it's my understanding from reading the Quran that borrowed money, loan money, uh, should receive only simple interest. That is, if you borrow $1,000, uh, you'll pay um, $100 back if it's 10% interest. Not compounded, but uh, completely, that's all you're going to pay is, is the $100 on it, not, not compounded, which would increase it by, I believe, around $26. When you get to large sums, like a mortgage for a home or something, this becomes uh, much more significant. His Holiness Baha'u'llah did say, however, that you can, you may, and I think this is in one of the uh, Tajaliyat, where he says, uh, or Israqet, excuse me, where he says, um, it is okay now to charge interest on loaned money. Uh, even as it was not okay and is not okay in the last dispensation. Then he goes on to say that uh, in Muslim countries, they go through all sorts of uh, gymnastics and gyrations and somersaults to try and charge money, but it's not really charging money. So for instance, when I lived in the uh, Arabic uh, Muslim country, um, and they, they would issue uh, credit cards. But of course, you didn't pay what they called uh, an interest rate because that's, uh, that's against uh, the teachings of Islam. You're not supposed to do that. So they called it a profit rate and went on doing pretty much what we do over here. There are, again, there are other things that we take from the Quran that we use uh, in, in banking, for instance, uh, that we did not have until it was brought over from Islam. Bankruptcy is one. We didn't have anything like that in Western civilization. Uh, you didn't pay your bills. You went to uh, you went to jail and you stayed to, in debtor's prison until someone bailed you out or you died. Something like that, depending. But uh, there's a way out in Islam. It allows, especially for investments, Okay, you made a bad investment. Um, you don't owe any money uh, to the persons who invested in you. Um, they took their chances with you and, and, they, and they lost and you lost. But we start over. That enables the economy to continue and move rapidly, very fast. It's not burdened with so much debt. All right, that's a, just, just an example. Uh, the one I'm, I'm most familiar with uh, with how the Quran uh, has in it uh, information that we can use uh, in creating a new civilization, in the creation of the new civilization that's promised. There is a big wrestle, ma wrestling match going on, as you know, between, say, socialism, communism on the one side and capitalism on the other. The far left, the extreme left, or the extreme right, or something in between. Most economies today are what we call mixed economies. There's a role of government to help those who can't help themselves or who have lost everything, either permanently or temporarily. Uh, and there is also uh, great scope for um, a personal incentive, and uh, we allow the inventors uh, of, of new ideas and uh, those persons to uh, keep most of what they've earned one way or another. All right. So think about some questions for that part. So this is uh, what His Holiness Baha'u'llah has done here is to, is to really encourage us, encourage us to study the, uh, the, the Quran. Now, this isn't easy, of course. Uh, New uh, translations of uh, the Quran from Arabic into English and other languages have proliferated, but none of them, none of those, sorry, uh, was produced by a believer in Baha'u'llah, as far as we know. So we do not have what you might call uh, an illuminated or an enlightened translation. And this is a incredibly important. Well, the reason being, for instance, that 
there are verses in the Quran that we understand, we as Baha'is understand immediately, but uh, non-Baha'is would not. For instance, there is a verse that says, and with hands did we create the heavens. Well, I've seen in, in later translations that it says, and with power did we create the heavens, because they thought to them, translators thought to themselves, what the heck could this mean? This makes no sense at all. It must be, never mind. We'll just put in power and go on with what we're doing. Well, now, I'll give you the reference for that. I have it here uh, later on during questions. We know what hands are. Hands are the cause of God. And what is the heavens that they created? The heavens of the knowledge of God. They instructed us and showed us by demonstration and by uh, their, their most beautiful example, how to live, how Baha'i should live. Abdu Baha did this and they, and, then, and they also did it. If you lived long enough to have the incredible bounty of meeting one of the hands of the cause of God, you'll know, you'll know what I mean. You'll know what I mean. So it was the hands of the cause of God that built the heavens of the knowledge of God. In another place, uh, Muhammad reveals where it says, have you not looked at the heavens, how we have created it, and there are no rifts in it? That is no separation in it or divisions or anything. He uses in it. Well, what could this mean? Well, yeah, you look at the sky and that's, no, 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 no. If all he did was to come and tell us about something we already knew from the, a five-year-old child would know by looking at the sky, and what would be the point of that? Rather, the heavens, again, the heavens of the knowledge of God. The heavens of the knowledge of God. And there are no rifts in it. That is, there is one God. And there is one revelation. And this same revelation has been, over time, continuously, book by book, revealed until we get to this place, to this point. You don't see different heavens. You don't see a Muslim heaven and a Christian heaven, etc. You just see one heaven. That's a lesson for us if we take it. And again, we move on and on, and there are many, many things that he, uh, that Muhammad revealed. And uh, when you look at the in interpretation of them in the English language, it looks as if, uh, you know, it's very, very limited and doesn't really give you uh, a true or deeper full understanding. Um, another example. Another example, the earth, uh, the earth was made in six days. The heavens and the earth, the world was made in six days. And then God rested from his work. Okay, uh, literalists believe that it was actually six 24 hour days, even though the sun wasn't made until the fourth day. So there was no sun to measure the first three days. Um, there are other problems with that. In another place, His Holiness Muhammad reveals where he says, and we made the heavens and the earth in two days. And how, could, how, do you, how, how do you make sense of those? Well, well, we have it. We have it explained to us in the Kitab Yagran, in the Book of Servitude. Count with me. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Christ, Muhammad, six days. These are days, these are dispensations of the word of God to mankind. And the, the, the earth of understanding, the earth of our capacity to understand the word of God. And the heavens of the knowledge of God, which rain down by way of faith and spirit, the meaning, it's under, giving us the, under, the understanding and giving us good, moist, fertile soil so that we can grow good fruits in our lives, which are, of course, our character and our deeds. That's what is meant. So then we now know immediately, we can take from this, what is meant by the heavens and the earth were made in two days. What would the two days be? Perhaps, and I'm only speculating because I don't have a solid answer on it. It's still rather unknown. It could be the Bab and Baha'u'llah. 
because the the bob would be both the end of the old the old cycle and the beginning of the new. So if you wanted to put that there, you could. There are many other ways of figuring it out, but obviously it doesn't mean 24 hour days. It means something far beyond that, far beyond that. And continue, continue with this, with this uh, challenge yourself to think of what many of these things mean. For instance, uh, um, and the wolf and the lamb will feed together. This is from Isaiah. Well, we know that wolves don't eat grass. They eat lammies. They eat little lammies that eat grass. And so how's that supposed to make sense? And just imagine if it literally came true. Just imagine if you, you woke up one day and over your morning coffee or tea, you look out your window or a window and you see a lamb and a wolf eating grass together in the same pasture. What would be your reaction? Perhaps to call the rest of the family to come to the window and see what you're seeing and saying, isn't it incredible? That is just amazing. That's just super. Wow. Who'd have thought? And yes, it was prophesied in the Bible. Yes, it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's for breakfast? I gotta go to work soon, et cetera, et cetera. What marriage has been healed, uh, sewn back together? Uh, what relationship has been healed? What country has laid down its arms? Where has peace broken out as a result of this? It has no effect on any of these things. So then what else could it be? Well, a wolf in character and a lamb in character in heart are now eating the same food, the food of God from the pasture of God. The person who was a wolf, that is absolutely untrustworthy. The person you do not want to have babysitting your children is now safe to be around them. And they are both eating the food of God, the manna from heaven that is sent down. And when were the Jews supposed to collect this manna? Before the sun came up at the dawn time. That's when the manna really comes out. As His Holiness Baha'u'llah explains in the Kitab i Gan, the first glimmerings, the, the time associated with the first announcements or pronouncements uh, of the manifestation of God, when still most of mankind uh, is asleep have an extraordinary power. A deed done in this day, in that time, he says, is worth uh, many deeds that were done uh, later on, a thousand deeds that might be done later on, or words to that effect. And this is in the Kitab Yigan. And why is that? Well, we can imagine that it's sort of like aiming, aiming a gun or aiming a bow and arrow or aiming a rocket ship toward, uh, toward Mars. Critical is the direction in which it, it is focused. It is aimed when it first leaves the launch pad or the rifle or the gun or the, or the bow. Because after that, there's not much you can do about it. With the rifle and the bow, there's nothing you can do about it. With the, uh, with the rocket ship, yeah, you can change it a little later on, but what's it gonna cost you? Fuel. And of course, the fuel is weight. And so you're going to need that fuel for doing sort of the manipulations you're going to need once you get to Mars, but you won't have it. So all you'll be able to do is uh, maybe uh, road, go around Mars a few times and then head back to Earth with whatever it was you discovered because you've run out of fuel. Same thing. So. We run out of time as human beings when we realize later on that uh, there are things we might do over if we could take back the years and start at, say, 19. No, 15. No, no, I take that back. Um, 
13, no 12, no, uh, what about seven? No, five, yeah, five, five, not three, three, there, I got it, three, three. Yeah, we do things a little differently. We would aim our life in a different direction. But uh, we didn't. And so now we are wise. We can't do much about it. <laughs> in the Quran, there's a verse that says, and for those whom we have granted long life, we shall reverse them in creation. Know they not that God is able to do all things? Well, what do they mean by reverse them in creation? Well, I could take a literal meaning from that and it would be very useful. We started out naked, no teeth. Our eyes didn't work very well. We had arms and legs. We didn't know what to do with them. And if we live long enough, unfortunately, we're going to end up approximately the same way before we are finally taken out of this life. My grandmother lived to 105, my mother to 98. Not really sure I wanna hang around that long, <laughs> considering all the changes that are happening today. Okay, there's another reason for, uh, that I'm going to uh, insert as a reason why we should, each one of us and individually and also in groups study the divine Quran, because what we have from older religions that exist now is not necessarily the core fundamentals of, of the teachings of that religion. Those have long since gone away. And what we have are churches or synagogues or temples or mosques, wherein we receive the teaching from God from other human beings. And schools have been set up over the centuries to uh, elucidate on this point or that point, or because as uh, Muhammad said, and it re revealed in the Quran, each person has taken some part of the religion and run away with it. And each one is proud of the, the part that he or she has, or they have. And so they, they do not be, he says, do not be of those who have divided the heavens. There's the heavens again. What's that mean? Well, knowledge of God. Don't make a lot of sex and divisions. Cling to unity, he says. And what is unity? Well, unity is life. How do we know that? Well, look at our bodies. What is it when we're sick? There's some sort of disunity going on inside our bodies. There's, a, there's an imbalance of the, of the natural uh, the natural tendencies, you know, we have to sort that out and get re re return to balance. And the same is true as it is for the individual body. It is for society as a whole. As His Holiness Baha'u'llah says, consider mankind like a body, the body of mankind as a human body. That is, uh, what, even though it was created well, it's now fallen on hard times, it's pretty sick and it, it needs it. But whenever a skilled doctor comes to it, he's pushed away, he's pushed away. So we know that this is the story of religion coming to mankind. So what do we have if we don't have religions? Good question. We have instead something called an ideology, ideology. What is an ideology as compared to say science and religion? By the way, science and religion are, are just two opposite sides of the same coin of reality. Science is, is, uh, deals with the, the physical and religion deals with the, with the sort of the why, the big why questions. Science is more about how, moving parts. But they both are reality. In fact, Abdul Baha has revealed, and I can find it, it's on my computer. Uh, Abdul Baha has revealed that science is the first emanation from God. I believe that's in uh, some answered questions, but uh, I'll have to find it. I will find it for you if you need it. The point is that it is the truth, it is reality. 
if you read the Quran and you read other places, it says, and God created all things from truth. Well, that pretty much says from laws, from laws that he has established that we discover. And then we use those laws by his permission, we can manipulate them to make a better world, a material world for ourselves, for instance. That's how we can, as Abdul Baha explains, go under the sea or fly in the air or do lots of things that an ordinary human body cannot do. We can also see things, see far away and very near, very close. All this is impossible with the ordinary human eye, but it's not for mankind because these two realities, scientific and religious, have been revealed. Uh, scientific ideology exists. There is a scientific ideology form of it. It usually, however, gets swept away with the formation of each and every new paradigm. As was uh, explained to us uh, by a scientist uh, out in the University of Chicago, get his name for you in the reference. These paradigms are ways of thinking. They, be, they create a structure wherein it is safe to do research. And uh, therefore, because it's safe to do the research and the research is meaningful, it can be funded. Eventually, however, what happens is new reality, new discoveries start to cut a hole, uh, cut holes and uh, take apart little pieces of that paradigm until the foundation of it no longer uh, suffices to support what's being done. And then what you have is a, is a new paradigm, new thinking. You know, there are, there are many of the examples of this. For instance, we once believed that the sun was the center of the universe. Then we learned differently. And uh, we also believe that uh, uh, different things about the universe and so that, et cetera. We also believe certain things about polio or cancer or blood, et cetera, or any of the physical things. So the same way that, that was true with science and therefore science gets, gets uh, rejuvenated. So does religion. Religion does through, as we know, uh, subsequent dispensations or revelations from God. But the old, uh, the existing religion doesn't go down without a fight, does it? That is to say, uh, we know, and uh, you can ask yourselves and answer this question for yourselves. Who are the greatest enemies against the revelation of the new, of the new religion, against the new manifestation of God? The established religions, of course, the, the heads, the clergy, the uh, higher ups of the established religion, because it's in their interest to defend what they have. And the same thing happens in science in a way when you when you uh, come with new, uh, with new uh, realities that you've discovered from your research, the persons who are still alive and establish the current paradigm, they're gonna fight you. And they won't have to do a lot of research because now they're big shots. And what they say is accepted as received wisdom. All they have to do is knock it down. That's why there's an old saying, I don't know where it originated from that says science uh, science moves on or progresses from funeral to funeral. When the old guy dies, then the new people can come in or the old, old uh, man or woman who's, who uh, defended the old paradigm uh, is finally passed on. Uh, then we can get on and get going with the, new, with the new research. It's possible to do it. The same is true with the uh, with religion in a way, except up to this point, the religions, all the different religions in the world have stood together in the world. One hasn't really replaced another, although after 2000 years, obviously there are many more Christians than Jews, but by teaching the Bible, the Christians also taught the Old Testament and that increased the number of Jews as well, people of Moses. His Holiness Muhammad, uh, they didn't teach the Quran the same way that the Christians uh, taught. And so in consequence, uh, there wasn't this uh, amazing outflow the, the way there was with, uh, with Christianity. So 
we, we learn, and I'm going to quote now something. Uh, you might think that it's a little bit off, but I'm going to quote something now from The Nature of Ideology, written by Alain Bessasson in his book, The Roots of the Gulag. Ideological re reality exists only as language. It is made of words. It cannot act on the real reality except by means of words belonging to the ideological reality and the subsequent transformation of the former, that is the real reality, can only be described in terms taken from the new reality. In other words, something like communism or capitalism, these exist between our ears and in our mouth, but they have no reality outside of our heads. Is this true about science? Is this true about the equations of science? No, they exist independently. How about religion? Same, the revelations of God exist independently of what we may think about them. We are told this in many, many places in many different ways. Whosoever desireth, let him turn aside from this council. And also Christ said, he who hath an ear, let him hear. And uh, others have said pretty much the same thing. If you, if you understand this, go with it. If you don't, go your own way. God is independent, as Baha'u'llah tells us, of what we may see or witness. So these are things that we learn and uh, from studying the Quran. And what we learn right away is that the representatives of the Quran today uh, for instance, uh, Shia Islam, Sunni Islam, uh, Wahhabi, um, and the, uh, all the other things that come off of that, like uh, the, 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 the wicked works of, uh, of, the, <clears throat> of ISIS or some of these other groups, the one that's just taken over Afghanistan, um, the name of the old leader I just got mixed up with, uh, the name of the guardian of Rizwan, Najibullah. Uh, the Russians came in, et cetera, et cetera. So now, now we have uh, this new group there and they're promising, oh, we've changed our ways. We're gonna be much better, et cetera, et cetera. What, are, is, this, is this true Quran? When we say we're going to, when they say we're gonna follow Sharia law, which Sharia law are they talking about? Are they talking about the one that exists in the Gulf states? That is uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Qatar or Oman and Kuwait, or a more, more and more mild one, a more uh, liberal one as exists in, in Oman and the United Arab Emirates, et cetera. Which one are you gonna hold to? And then, of course, there are two entirely different cosmologies. There's the Sunni and the Shia. And then, of course, after that, there is the Sufi, making sort of a third one. Our Islamic teacher, where I, where I worked as a uh, professor in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, you have to teach Islamic uh, studies there in, in all the schools there in the UAE. Uh, he had uh, two phones and he had a, uh, a buzzer. What did you use? Pager. Pager. This was before the one phone worked. He had two phones and a pager. And I used to joke with him. I said, let me guess. One pager is for the Sunnis. I mean that one, one phone is for the Sunnis. The other phone is for the Shias. And the pager is for the Sufis. He loved that joke. I love it too much, as you can tell. But what we discover is by understanding what an ideology is, religion is not an ideology. Religion is truth. And His Holiness Baha'u'llah tells us that the Quran represents the surest testimony of God to man. So we better read it. Then when we go through the, or before that, when we go through the Kitab Yagan, the Book of Certitude, he pulls out one after another, one place after another. In fact, I've made a list of all the references used in the Kitab Yagan that appear in the Quran and put them in, the, in two orders. One is the order in which they appear in the Kitab Yagan. And there you'll see a constant theme, a premise or a, uh, um, 
the beginning of it, what's to, what's to be argued, how it's going to be argued, the argument, evidence of the argument, and the conclusion, just like a beautiful scientific paper. Then when you go back and you look at the order in which they appear in the Quran, they skip around and move around from one thing to another. What other book does that? The Tabalak Das, it does the same thing. It follows one theme and then moves to another theme. And then goes on that for a while, then maybe returns to the pre previous theme with some more verses or goes on to another theme entirely. And it does this for our edification, for our understanding. I'm going to read you, I'm not going to read you the rest of this, uh, but I'll read you this one paragraph. This language, ideological language, becomes magical as it's powerless to create reality becomes apparent, incapable of modifying the real according to its ends, unable to create another reality which conforms to what it has promised. Its function, therefore, is to evoke in the magical meaning of the word, that is, to suggest a non-existent reality. In order to do so, it borrows from two things which have traditionally grafted themselves into religion and science. That is, the black mass, that is superstition, and quackery, that is fake science. It, is formula, it has a formula about itself because its power is linked to the letter and it, it, it is like an incantation because it is supposed to evoke and suggest something. Dedicated to suggest through words an illusory reality, side by side with the transcending real reality. It is the medium for that reality's necessary transfiguration. Does it work? No. You can't ever revise a uh, an ideology because it couple of things. Number one, uh, unlike science and religion, it does not believe that the end, that the means uh, is determined, uh, that determines the end. That is, if you use good means, you get a good end. And if you use evil means, you get an evil end. Nor does it allow uh, science. Science allows itself to be questioned. Can't wait to be questioned. It has the answers. Same with true religion. Same with true religion. It therefore is ready to explain because what is the goal of science and true religion? To explain, to inform, uh, to give a new teaching, to instruct. But what's the, what's the goal of ideology? To gain and maintain power. To gain and maintain power. That's the difference between science and religion on one side, ideology. If you keep that in mind, you'll have an easier time as you move through the Quran. But I suggest, absolutely, I insist that you read the Kitab Yagan first, because that is the book promised to us, even back 2,500 years ago in the book of Daniel, that unlocks and unseals the true meaning of all past religions. All right. This is the end of the formal uh, presentation. I would like to, uh, I'd like to entertain uh, questions, if I may. And uh, if you, I, I will have, uh, I will please ask Neda to, uh, to be the, uh, the gatekeeper for these, uh, these questions. Sure, um, Afsana, if you would, please. Thank you very much, Dalton. Um... Really great uh, stuff. I have a question about the verse in Quran, which says, we create it when you get old, then we reverse it. So mm. is it intentional that when people get old, it was God's intention to become exactly like an infant with no power to use their knowledge and their experiences that they have learned? I can't say this for sure, but evidence seems to suggest it. Because for most persons, they do lose their intellectual acumen and their memory goes. So it's much harder for them to recollect and put things together and make uh, 
rational uh, thoughts. Some of us, uh, for this, some of us sadly happens early in life, and for others, it happens at their last breath. But for most of us, it happens as we get older. With each, with each year, we get a little dumber, let's say. Dumb in the sense of we can't quite remember correctly, and uh, uh, it's harder for us to, uh, to put uh, thoughts together. So you think it was God's plan that everybody on their own will find these truths instead of using the experience of the older ones who live longer and gain more wisdom? Well, man is not supposed to uh, live uh, independent from the rest of mankind or communities or completely alone. So it is by... Uh, mixing the ages together that all, all of them uh, are enriched. But, you know, this is just sort of common, um, <clears throat> common knowledge and understanding them <clears throat> that I'm share, sharing with you. I'm sure you'll think the same thing. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as Mark Twain, the famous uh, American novelist and philosopher in his own right once said, youth is wasted on the young. And I might add to that, wisdom is wasted on the old. Thank you. Derek, please. Now please unmute yourself, Derek. This was a, a great talk, but and my question is, uh, based on what you just said about ideology, would you say fundamentalism is actually ideological or fundamentalism is, is based on ideology? Fundamentalism is an ideology. It insists on a literal interpretation of every word of God. We can understand why it did this. It did this because it saw sort of what they call the, the thin edge of the wedge or the slippery slope where you begin to translate, you begin to uh, liberalize this meaning, then that meaning also gets liberalized, et cetera, et cetera. That's the same argument that's used uh, by gun owners to say we don't need gun laws. Um, and the results are, are the same. Uh, it's, a, it's an ideology. It's, it's a form of, of uh, it forces an interpretation on all the words of God that uh, is not meant for all the words of God. Obviously, some of the words are. For example, the laws and ordinances, thou shalt not kill. That's pretty straightforward. Let's not fool around with it. It's pretty clear to me. Um, but others, like, and the sun and the moon will be joined together. What the heck does that mean? Do we really expect the sun and the moon to be joined together? And if so, the moon is, the sun is so much larger than the moon. We could put uh, millions of, of earths inside the moon and we could put millions of moons inside the sun. I'm sorry, we could put millions of earths inside the sun and, and also millions of moons inside the sun. So how could they be joined together? We'd be burned to a cinder, well, which means something entirely different. Let's speculate a minute on what it could mean. Well, I'll, I'll save that for later. If you want to know, ask me later and I'll get to it. Let's get to some of the other questions now because lots of people have questions. Uh, Penny, please. So Dalton, I have a different perspective uh, on aging. And I'm, I find that as, like I'm 75, as I get older, I become uh, more spiritual. Now, this might be because we're on borrowed time. We're all coming to the end, whatever. But, you know, if I continued to look the way I looked when I was 25, I would never, like, this is a gift. These wrinkles are a gift. This is the gift of, if we want to acknowledge it or not, a gift of the spirituality that so I would just like to hear your thoughts about that. Oh, there's a hidden word on it. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, there are several, in fact. 
the one that I've memorized. Let's see if I can pull it up because I'm getting old myself here. I'm right behind you. I'm 73. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, oh, friends, abandon not the everlasting beauty for a beauty that must die. And uh, what's the rest of it? Do you know the rest of it? A beauty that must die. Anyway, there's another part that says, uh, free thyself from the fetters of this world. Right. And, and thy soul from the prison of self. It says, seize thy chance for it shall come to thee no more. And then we read in, in places where His Holiness Baha'u'llah says, uh, when he's revealing uh, the Lo i Buran and, and some of the other uh, uh, tablets uh, to those who were persecuting him, he said, you will get old. You're like the last bit of light on the mountaintop. In another place, he says, soon you will be old. What then can you achieve? How can you then atone for your past failure? You won't be able to. Because our ability to act will be limited as our body becomes more limited. And this is the wisdom that I think uh, God has intended for us, as you say. Mm -hmm. He wants us to become detached from this life. Uh, and it's weaker and weaker, that's gonna happen. You just can't do stuff. You can't entertain yourself as you once did. Ice skating is out. Hiking big mountains is out, et cetera, et cetera. And for those persons, who um, have become incapacitated due to uh, disease or accident, they do this major furniture moving around far before we do. And they are far more wise in that sense if mm -hmm. they learn patience and resignation than we are or may even ever be. Um, and I just just to, just look at what happened when uh, Gorbachev tried to revive revise the uh, uh, the ideology of communism. It fell flat on its face, as Solzhenitsyn said it would. He said uh, in one of his, I think in one of his essays, it wasn't in one of his books that I remember, where he said, this thing, if you just take it down and people stop listening to it, it has no existence, it has no independent existence of its own. It'll just fall away and die, which is pretty much what it did. Other ideologies die harder, like racism, Nazism, anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera, um, or other things. Like I that. would like to thank you, Dalton, for because I I never read the Koran before. We I went online and I you were studying it with us and stuff, and it has really opened up my heart to the uh, the Koran and to Muslims and like you know we don't know sometimes what we don't know. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, that brings to mind. One other thing I forgot to mention, who is going to teach the Muslims? Who would be better teaching them than those who truly understand the divine Quran? Now, they may not accept the teaching, but that has nothing to do with our responsibility to reach out to every human being. And if we understand the, the meaning of it, certainly some, certainly some, and certainly many actually may come into the fold of Baha'u'llah and see the true meaning of the word of God as revealed in all the ages and by all the manifestations. Thank you so much, Dalton. Uh, friends, do we have any other questions? Okay, I did put um, Dalton's email in the chat. So feel free to um, email him with any further questions. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Garris. Uh, one one thing, one last thing. There was something I said I was going to say later on, if time allowed. Anyone remember what it is? Because I've forgotten. It was a little while ago. Oh, come now, somebody must remember. No. About the moon and the sun. Yeah, the moon ah, and the sun. that's it. Thanks so much, yes. What could this possibly mean? 
Well, let's think about it for a minute. What is the flag of Turkey today in the Ottoman Empire before the fall of the Ottoman Empire? What, what, what's the flag? What's on it? What are, what's the symbol of it? That's Sunni Islam, uh, for that matter. Crescent moon. moon. Crescent moon. Mm -hmm. What is the symbol that's on the flag of the Persian Empire? Maya? The sun? The yeah, sun. the sun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? The sun and the moon shall be joined together in hellfire, it says in the Kitab Yagan. The sun represents Persia. The moon represents the Ottoman Empire. And as they both persecuted Baha'u'llah and the Baha'is and the Babis, they are going to experience punishment as they are, as they are. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.